conversation area. He was talking about one of the major fire departments. And they uh, did some digital testing. Some reluctance. And I would, you know, a lot of the departments have had that same thing. I was having a hard time quite comprehending why the reasoning was there about. And what they were looking at is an analog. If you have two people talking and a third person, say it's a mayday, comes up and wants to key in, you know. Even if you can't hear him, you hear what? You'll hear the heterodyne or the interference or something coming up. So they like that as a way of saying, oh, somebody else is trying to key up. Well, could be some, you don't know what they're keying for, but uh, you know, today, technology, if we're doing a mayday, what's your mayday be, right? That red button. And what should that red button take you to? Ideally, it should take you to another channel that's strictly so that nobody else talking take you to another channel that's for that mayday. There was a discussion on the uh, one of the radio lists uh, probably a couple of weeks ago, some of you are probably on it, about uh, <coughs> dealing with the simplex. You know, running trunk systems when your firefighter goes into the building and they're running on the trunk. How many, how many people do that? How many people are running, their firefighters are going in a building and they're staying on a trunk system and all the communications is running? How many people switch to direct chain fire ground simplex? Okay. And the issue is with digital, you know, is how do you do that? How do, can you understand what the person's saying? If you if you take them off of the trunk, the dispatchers can't hear the guy inside. You know, so it's 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 a big issue. You know, you see that in the disaster, we see it all the time. And, uh, one of the things that we've done. And we do it, we've done it like for major events like NASCAR races, where I first started doing NASCAR races with Pokemon Raceway back in the late 80s, early 90s. We ran about six or seven UHF repeaters. And uh, invariably, the repeaters, you know, would go down for something. Somebody would kick a plug or, you know, you lose power or whatever. Now you got everybody out there sitting on that repeater channel trying to talk and repeaters went right. And you're talking about 250 radios, maybe, that you've handed out to people who never used the radio except that week for the race. And they don't understand the difference between, you know, repeat, simplex, or direct. To get them to switch over, you know, how do you do that? So what we always did, all of the command radios, the compromise, and think about this, especially the techs, Put the reverse pairs. The hands do it all the time. Everybody wants the hand radio. You can hit a bump button on the hand radio. It flips it. It'll flip your pair. So that you can, now, when I'm talking on my portal, I'm talking, um, I, I can reverse the pair so I can hear the input. In other words, the portables are trying to talk to the repeater. The repeater's not working. It's not hearing. The power's off. But I can hear that input on my portable. So I can act sort of like a repeater manually. Because when I key, Everybody's going to hear me, but I can hear the input coming back so I can hear them. All right? Then I can either just tell everybody repeaters down, you know, all, cramp, all communications is in a controlled net, so I can do an amateur, you know, call dispatch or call command, whatever. And command has to handle the traffic manually. Or hopefully, if you've got a well programmed, uh, well properly programmed and well identified and good trained you know, people, you can get them to go to simplex because then you can key up and just tell everybody. You know, go to the simplex channel or whatever your designation is. So think about that. It's, it's you know, same issue on, uh, you know, when you have a fireman in a building. What happens when you go inside of a structure with any radio? I mean, depending on the structure, some of you are, you know, I'm sure in major cities, can you get into your system in the basement of building X? Right? I mean, you have that problem? You have yeah. buildings when you go into the basement, some of your buildings you can't talk? Definitely. Okay. He's with NASA. Um, so how do you handle that? If you're trying to fight the fire in that basement, now what do you do? What's your, what do you do down there? I mean, is it We're trying to get some in-building bi-direct amplifiers, but we've got people to go to Simplex. Go to Simplex, yeah. yeah. So, you know, there again, that's part of, you know, that's got to be part of the pre-planning. Gentleman was telling me that fire department, that fire department's policy is you never change channels. <laughs> you know? And there's some logic behind that because you know it can cause the confusion. But it's all a matter of the training. You know, we'll talk about that a little bit later. As you know, from the communications 
standpoint. There's an, an analogy that I kind of like. I mean, would we put our law enforcement out in the field with a gun and not train them how to use that gun? No. Would we not train them how to use that gun under a stressful situation? Okay. Very rarely. In today's day and age, you know, what's the big thing? It's simple. You know, we're putting them either on screens where they're having to make fire, don't fire decisions that quick. They're putting them under lots of noise, they're smoking the buildings, they're doing, you know, in some of the bigger departments that have, you know, complete ranges. You know, that are interactive ranges, they're going, they're having to run, they're getting the adrenaline going, all right? Because what, is that real world? Yes, you've got to be able to make that fire, don't fire decision in real world, you know, situations. But we'll take and give, the, give that officer this in a lot of departments, and what training they get? Very little, none. Some departments do give them a lot, which is good. But I'll tell you, a lot of departments don't. And what's their lifeline? Is that gun their lifeline? No, the gun's a lawsuit problem. All right? It may save their life, and they need to have that. But that's their first lifeline, right? That's what they're going to normally go to. Mayday, mayday, help, help. You know, go 13. All right? And if they don't understand how to use this, they're going to be on the wrong channels. They're screaming into it. All right? The digital, I think, actually handles that screaming better than the analog. Because why? It's got the filtration in there. It's actually cutting out certain parts of it on either side. It's only taking what you really need to get to, to limit the data flow. It cuts out, cuts out some of that. So it actually handles it better. Um, you know, so you have to look at those training programs and how are we going to train, train the officers? You need to set up that program. And it doesn't need to be three days, but you need to give it a couple morning, a couple hours in the morning or a day or something and run, run it through. And it's everything. It's, it's from a you know, public works guy all the way up because he can be put into that, you know, confined space situation where his partner's in the hole, you know, and something happened and he's standing up top, you know, trying to get help. So it's, it's something you need to look at within your departments and agencies. All right. Are there any questions before we move on? I see we lost a few, but we kept most of them. Um, nothing. Command post. I think from looking at the list, and I got to see, you know, from what departments most of you are from the sign-up list, uh, this is something that probably all of you could be into. How many of you have, um, if you're in a facility, I mean, everybody's got a, a, a dispatch center. How many people are running EOCs? Emergency management EOCs. Question. Okay. Um, how many of, you, of those people have had to set up a temporary command post away from your normal EOC? Very well, everybody. Okay. We're going to talk about some of those types of things. Um, that. How many people have a command post that costs over $10,000? <laughs> Most of you. Okay. You gotta remember, I did. You know, that's where we get our money. Uh, most of our command posts have been over the years have been old school buses. But you know what? It works. But a lot of times you can take and have the $250,000, $300,000 motorhome, and there's some really nice ones out there. Probably have some of them. And what happens? They don't want to be in the firehouse, right? They don't want to be in the, the church because it's, it's, it's more comfortable. And there's bathrooms and it's cold outside and it's raining. So the command post is really, it's a necessity. But what happens now when all of the people are migrating into that church or firehouse or whatever it may be? Because there's more room, there's bathrooms, there's food, whatever. There's, you know, isn't it probably a more logical place to really set up operations? Because if you've got a big operation going, you're going to end up with how many people? I know the EOC in Hancock was, I mean, it was wiped out. And, uh, you know, FEMA through EMAC brought in people from all over the country. The EMAs brought them in under the EMAC program. 
and set up a command post. Uh, the first one was at a school, technical trade school. And that's the uh, shop, mechanical, uh, I think that's the woodworking area. Yeah, I believe that was the woodworking and accommodation stuff in the shop at Hancock County uh, Vocational. That was a Rhode Island guy. Anybody from Rhode Island here? I didn't see anybody. Great bunch of guys. I worked with them for about a week. They have a state use of it's not a team, it's a state use of our team. And uh, you know, they basically, most of the state teams are set up virtually, I'm sure some of you work with them, are set up just like the team team. And they set up their command post in that shop. We, we were set up in our trailer because we had a, uh, a big trailer we brought in. So we were set up outside, but we were interfacing. We were At that point, we were working with dogs, maybe guys doing some combo stuff. And we, we had a recovery task force in there. We were providing all the dogs to Hancock and some of the surrounding areas for, for cadet dogs for about two months under three, uh, three or four different meeting member requests. Um, but basically, there again, it's a matter of all that great stuff in the motorhome, you just don't have that room to be able to maintain the staff that some of these events are going to generate. You just can't do it, you know? Uh, you know, and I'll pick on, on Lackawanna County, PA. Hopefully nobody's here. Anybody from Lackawanna County? You know, we got it through our, our Northeast Regional Terrorism Task Force, and then that money came in, and they, uh, two of the counties up there, both got these motorhomes. LB Bill, I'm not sure. I think LB Bill. Uh, they got every radio in the world in this thing. You know, we've got our open sky, multiple UHFs and DHFs and, and everything. You see this desk? I don't have that much room to walk from front to back when everybody's sitting in there, right? It's just, it's a space issue. You know, it's just, there's just not enough room in it when you try to put that many people in that many. And then they don't have enough, they didn't have enough headsets, so it's open audio, the guys back there shaking, I've been there doing that one, you know. You get one or two radios going without a headset on, you know, as an operator, it's hard, it's hard. You've got to have that, you know, got to have that headset, boom microphone, noise canceling on it. So, you're going to, invariably, what you do is, and we do with ours, is, you know, keep your comm guys probably out there, and how do we deal with the people inside? Do you have do you have, a, you have a command post where you're shaking? Can you remote? Are you running what APSs or your APS capable? Can you remote yes. inside a building? Yes, we can. Okay, so they're they're doing that. So if you don't have that capability, that's to me the biggest advantage then to the big interoperability thing has been the capability of doing IP. All right, taking our radio like we they've got set up here. We'll, we'll get into that later and be able to remote those radios over that Cat 5 into the building and either sit at a laptop. Now, I'm not a big fan. I run a lot of laptops. I did a system last year for National Guard. We had two laptops and 22 fixed telex. Because what happened when we were up here getting reasonably started late? Connector. They get the power. So I said, I got a 35 millimeter you know, slide projector with them works the best, right? You know, my show, my my show, my class last year, and my telex kit demo and everything else there, and made a full out of me. I ran that thing three times before I left. I ran it the night before the class. I got here and it wouldn't work, right? Because the laptop acted up. The, the telex boxes were working. Okay. The laptop acted up. So I had two laptops just sitting. Got my backup. So I'm, I'm, I'm a hard believer on, uh, I think that's uh, Vega. It's, uh, this is the 2002 Telex, okay? And uh, basically it's, it's an IP console that will let us run two lines, or two channels. It was pretty well all the functionality depending on what radio you have it on there. Um, off of the, so I, with that, I can take two radios, I take two, two conventional radios. I can take a 223, which is their radio interface box. Their box will handle two radios, okay, within the box. And with that box, you can do cross. Just with that box, it'll let you do a cross patch. 
without anything else. Don't need a computer or anything else. You can set that up and do that real simple. But then you, you of course, you can plug your network and take your uh, cat five block of that and run it into your network, whatever kind of network you're running. And it'll address the program, it'll address up to one of those, or you can go to the 10 unit, 10 channel, or the 16, and you'll see a picture of the 16 that we ran for the dark. Um, we ran 250 radios, uh, 22 hard consoles. When I say hard console, it's not a computer screen. And they sell the software. And I'll tell you it right out, uh, it's overpriced. And a lot of these softwares are way overpriced. And I think they, they hurt themselves in the long run by asking for $3,000 for a program on one laptop. Um, and we had 16 channels. <coughs> so 16 channels of audio. And we shared the network with the data system that was tracking, because it's the National Guard they're using, you know, this is war game. Uh, so they're tracking, they're running video, they're running all the tracking data, every single soldier, and that's you know, about 500 uh, units were being tracked, uh, GPS locations, who fires a gun, what gets hit, all that data plus video, massive amount of data on this network. Uh, I had two burps in the system, two different days, and it was when they, and that was because we learned from there we need to filter our IPs a little better because the those consoles, the Telex says, it, oh, it doesn't do that, well, it does. It's having to listen to all those addresses, all that data is coming into that because it's on that network. So you want to either have a separate network or you need to put some management into your IP, which is very easy to do. We ended up doing it in the end and it eliminated it. But that system ran for uh, over a month with that kind of traffic. But I never had a burp out of the Telex. I'm, I'm a, you know, a pretty big fan of the Telex in that respect. Um, but you can then remote your radios in. And however you do it, JPS will do the same thing. It's great. Uh, C, uh, CAT, you know, their system will do it new. Now, they just came up a bit. Anybody running the uh, ICRI system from CAT? Um, it's real nice. They're real, they've been really popular with the military, and they, I think they're trying to come into a push now to get into public safety. It's, We'll have that here later. Uh, real nice unit. Did not have that IP capability, so that was kind of a drawback. But it's a real nice, it's, you know, portable, you can do a man pack with it and everything else. So it's a really nice functional unit. We've used it a number of times for training, so, and it works real well. So they now have the <coughs> capability on that, too. And it's very simple, and, they, and it's reasonable. Pricey. So you can need to be able to set up your temporary command post if you go into a building and they're getting um, what does the command post have to have? Plain and so it's communications, right? What's the first thing we have to put in there? Phones, right? Radios. Do they ever ask the communicator, where's the best place to set up this command post? <laughs> have they ever asked anything like that? <coughs> Should we go to this building or that building? This one's in the hole, that one's up on the ridge. We can go to either one. Which one should we go to? No, they go to the one in the hole, right? Plain so. Uh, that's a never ending battle. You have to try and, and for some of the administrators, and we have a few administrative level people in here, you know, think about that, promote that, you know, get the input from your comm guys. It's real important. How are we going to get all those phone lines in there? You know, how are we going to get the radios to talk? You know, oh, by the way, we're going to be in. That building in the valley would be two stories down in the basement because that's where all the extra room is. All right? And nothing talks. So, how do we get the signal coming out of it? Command post trailers. Uh, we use a lot of trailers because they're inexpensive. Um, that's, this is the one we had down at Katrina that was bought with donations from 9 11 after spending. Uh, Two weeks in the mud at the landfill, we decided the donations we had that we wanted to not have to be walking around in as much mud. And that was primarily originally was purposed as a supporting unit for the canines, and it still does do that function. It's uh, fairly flexible. And uh, this is a little bit smaller guy that we have that uh, it's kind of tight, but it's easy to move, it's easy to get through. You know, one of the problems of getting into. Trade center with 
trailers. We didn't have anything that big. We had one about that size. You get something, 35, 40 foot motorhome, you're not going to get a lot of wood support. You wouldn't have gotten it where we went in New York City then. How many people still use a paper radio log? Hey, it works, right? Uh, it's real critical, and it's, you know, what happens a lot of times when you're getting out in these field deployments, people have a tendency not to get that log out, or I'll get it later. Right? If you're not recording, and there's some really nice and expensive ways to record your traffic, um, you know, there's like scanner, recorder, I forget the name of it, uh, it's a free program, you can get it, you can run on a laptop, and just dedicate a cheap laptop as your a single channel, but it's a box, it's a box operated recorder that you can run on a laptop, so you just need to feed your audience in it. And you can record one channel if you've got a simple system. And there's a lot of other ones out there. You can get four channel, eight channel, and you know, go up from there that are fairly nice and portable hard drive systems that you can run in a mobile environment. Um, we run a four channel digital, we run video and audio, two channels, audio, four channels, video. Now we can do that. For a couple of years, and that's about a thousand dollar box that I think is probably down to about six, five or six hundred dollars or even less now to do that. So, and then just put your signs up, and we, we record open. We have actually we have one channel as our primary audio, and then the other audio is open mic, and then we have a couple cameras inside and outside. Um, one does uh, one one channel does uh, video off of one computer screen as a converter to convert sort of analog video. We record that, and that's a hard drive based. Okay. Very inexpensive when you put that whole thing together. We, we probably didn't have more about $1,500 into it. Uh, but it gives us documentation uh, strictly when we need to go back and say, hey, we can't find something, or what happened here, or you know, get into the issue. But a paper log, and we duplicate everything, so we maintain that paper log. You know, so, Paperwork, paperwork. It's still critical even in, a, in an environment in the field, whether you're in a command post truck, a chief's truck, you know, or the Bay of Firehouse. How many people run a cross band linking of any kind? You know, JPS, how many people we have in here have a, a switch or matrix uh, or something they're using? A lot of you don't, right? Is that what I'm saying? A lot of you don't have any kind of cross-band capability in our interoperability box. Good. I think we do. It's good. So hopefully we can shed some light on that world. Um, cross-banding. Motorola's little black box. All right, little RIP controller. Anybody using these? Right? Love them. I'll tell you, really, it's, it's a great unit. Um, we still have, our, our repeaters are still running Motorola's um, Axtrack and Radius with these controllers on them. Uh, it's, it's, I've never had them fail. I can't really think of anything to have them. Um, it'll give you a repeater or you can do a cross band. We, we have two repeat. We have one that does a VHF to UHF cross. They're all in the shipping in you know, little cases. So we can ship them out, and what we'll do is we'll do a uh, we can do a VHF link. We can reprogram. Uh, we're probably going to upgrade the radios and those uh, to something a little bit easier to program than Motorola, just because of their old radio stuff because they haven't worked good. Uh, <coughs> but you punch that button, and you can take your audio and either do a repeater, standard repeat, radio A receives it. And what we're doing is we're hooking two mobile radios. Taking two mobile radios, and this is controlling the two, the audio and the push and talk. So we're going to receive it. Radio A comes through the box. We transmit on B. All right, that's repeat. Linking, we're taking VHF on A, UHF on B. Everything I hear here transmits there. Everything I hear here transmits over here. So we're just taking two different systems, UHF, VHF. Can we do that in band? Yes, with a lot of limitations. Because we have to watch our desensing 
And uh, the guys with CAT are going to talk about that, uh, desensing this afternoon, you know, those issues, because you know, we take two portables. You know, a lot of guys get GPS and they throw a bunch of portables sitting down on the table together. Okay? And they got a VHF, a VHF, a VHF, a UHF, and they're trying to talk from FBI to uh, CIA or city, whatever, and that's VHF and that's VHF. And they got two four watt radios, foot apart, keying up at four or five watts. It has a tendency not to work. It may work, it may not. But they don't understand how come, well, I'm hearing this. But when I link them together, I can't hear that anymore. This transmitter, this VHF transmitter is desensing. It's basically stepping on it because it's so close. The power from this one is being received by this one and blocking out what it's supposed to hear. Simple explanation. Um, so he, he's going to talk about desensing this afternoon. A bit. But uh, cross banding, normally in cross banding, we're talking two bands. And we can do that from 800 over to VHF. UHF to 800, 700 to VHF, whatever, you know, within certain limitations. Uh, we can do uh, cell phone to a radio patch and stuff like that. So there's a lot of different capabilities in it. So that was really this, and uh, that's the RIC. And there's a bunch of different ones out there. Uh, ICR, Zetron uh, has made a nice little box for quite a while. It'll allow you to hook up two repeaters and give you foam patch and everything into it. Um, the rig's real, real popular. Uh, radio over IP. I'm just trying to find uh, The other unit, and I think I repositioned that slide for a reason. The other unit that's real popular, anybody been using transcript? Repeater maker? Have you heard of it? Well, that was, that was really the first interoperability uh, unit out there. The very first was actually an ICOM headset. We made the first one in the late 70s uh, with a ICOM Fox headset controller. We take two of those Fox headset controllers, connect the two radios, and let that Fox controller do our switching and push to talk. That was really the first interoperability. And I'm not the first one who's done it. That's been done by quite a few. Well, myself, Gene Harrison from uh, Appalachian Search and Rescue, he used, uh, used to work for Miter, I'm sure he's still with Miter, uh, which is a thing. Yeah. And uh, John Kuykenhoven from Transcript. Uh, we got together in the late 80s, so we had a problem with field interoperability and being able to talk, making a repeater, a cheap and expensive repeater, and talking between UHF and VHF. Two big problems in the wilderness situations. So he looked at it, and where was the search and rescue wasn't in the market, because most search and rescue teams don't have a lot of money, um, and there's not a lot of them back in the 80s. But what there was a lot of was firefighting, wildlife, Boise, right? and they have been used extensively over the years as part of that cache. Uh, I'm not sure how embedded they are in that system now with all the new technology, but for years that was a staple for the Boise fire cache systems. Um, but that's just a little box, and basically it does the same thing with the one thing that was thrown in, it had, it had RF detection. It could detect when the radio was key, which helped in making the switch a little faster. Um, but it also made it sensitive to, if you tried to put it in a site that was at, a, or say, a repeater site with 20 radios, or even two or three other radios, that was a problem because it would pick up that other but for in a wilderness situation, I could take, and it worked with the Bendix Kings primarily in the beginning, because that's what we were using. Um, and it was just hooked the two portables together. We could do the exact same thing. We could do cross band, right? UHF to VHF, or we could take take our portables, set them at two watts. And we used to take PVC tube, all right? We put the controller in the center, we'd stuff one in the bottom of the phone, and it would sit at the bottom of the tube here. Control would be up in here, right? Control was powered off one radio. And the other one was at the other end of the tube, and then we'd hang, we could take that tube, throw a rope up over a tray, and pull that tube up in the air. So now what do we have? Sort of like a dipole, you know? We have one transmitting, one receiver. Receiver on the top, transmitter on the bottom, usually. All 
all right? And that would hang from the tree like that. Really quick, down and dirty, and you'd be surprised, it worked very well. It was only running two watts, but we made up for the lower power by going elevation. Remember what I said? Higher is better. Get it up, get it up. Yeah. And there's just one thing that you have to watch out for with the uh, JPSs or any of those interrupt uh, function. If you have a long hang time on your main repeater, yes. and you don't use a control station to hit that repeater, you can end up in a situation called ping pong where the uh, repeater spilch tail actually causes the control station to go back online again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just one thing, if you're going to do that, that's fine, and it works, but you just have to adjust, and all repeaters I've ever seen have that adjustment, the hang time of the repeater right. down is, uh, to a minimum amount, and it will work fine. Right. What he's talking about is when you're using any of, any of uh, most of the time on the, on the original, like on the transcript unit when we were doing that, we didn't, we didn't run it through repeaters. If you're connecting to a repeater and trunking gets harder, and those, even with a JPS or any of the newer stuff, now some of them actually have capabilities built into the Telex and JPS and have capabilities for timing. And um, what happens is the, if the repeater had a long hang time, that hang time actually locks up and then you could actually get a ping pong as where it's bouncing. It's key release, key release, key release. Uh, most of the systems out now have uh, electronic ways of defeating them. Okay. Uh, but if you, could, if you reduce, if you basically eliminate your hand time, that's what we used to do in the early days, we used to try to connect the computer on one side, uh, bring their hand time down virtually to zero. We eliminate that. Any questions? All right, we talked a little bit about uh, radio over IP. Um, we have a LAN, a LAN based system is what we would normally set up at, you know, with a command post. Um, your command post, you got networking in your command post, right, running computer. So you can extend that out. We have an example. Dave, JJ from Trackstar have the, uh, they got the satellite dish set up outside and we'll be out there this afternoon and they can show you in detail anything you want to see about that system and how it works and what they do and all that magic. Uh, it's really pretty simple. We can see the links is over here. And I think, are we up, Dave? You here? So if anybody needs to check their emails, uh, we're open, all right? We're open. Yeah, I think it's just radio interrupt. Radio interrupt. So you need to check your emails, it's up and running. Now yeah, you can get in. I think I think we have free in the building here now. Um, so we're running, they're running the satellite, which is parked outside, and they're doing a 2.4. Surprisingly, all of the stuff around them, there was about 10 or 12 2.4 access points that I could see right outside the hall. There's three channels to uh, so, if you're doing anything with 2.4, if you're running any of that, make sure you have a program that you know what channels. Uh, there's a great one out there called NetStumbler. It's a freebie, and it'll let you go in there and you can see uh, all the systems, whether they're locked or open. Uh, the new, I think the new version will show, <coughs> even if it's not, if it's not broadcasting, it'll show it to you. You won't get the idea. Uh, you'll still see a system. So, and it gives you the channel and the system ID if it's broadcasting ID and all that. Um, so, it's a real good tool if you're setting up, especially, well, whether even if you're setting up in your home environment, it, it's still a handy thing. It's a lot cheaper than going out and buying one of those busy bees for a couple thousand dollars. Um, it will show you all the systems that are out there. And what happens is, most routers, a lot of them come on six. So, there was about, I think, seven access points on different systems, all in channel six. What happens? It's like a radio, you know? This one's talking, this one's talking, this one's talking. It's interference, play it so, so, you know, you, we had a bunch of channels open, we were able to just pick a channel. So make sure you, there you go, add that to your toolbox for the tech guys that are out in the field. 
you know, get one of the programs. Some of the new uh, laptop programs that come with your uh, wire, wireless actually have some real nice signal strength indicators that you get the channel on that on as well. Uh, but a lot the LAN, if you set up your own LAN, whether you're connecting it to the satellite, uh, sometimes it's as simple as a piece of Cat5 from your device into the building, plugged into the laptop. You know, might just be that simple. But it gives you that capability of being able to uh, remote the radios. And we'll have, we'll have a demonstration later. We're going to talk around the country different spots around the country through the satellite on uh, the uh, radio over right there. Uh, you can do your cross-channel operations. Well, you can do in-band. We can take, uh, with the uh, 2002 over there, I can, that's the simplest on the telex, would be two radios. So I can operate those two channels with dispatch console. I could have five or six of those in that firehouse working the two radios. You've got your intercom. If somebody's talking, you'll hear their side of the conversation. It's going out the radio, and you'll hear it's got an intercom path on it. Um, it's reasonably priced box, uh, $1,400, $1,500. I think they were listed the last time or so. Um, and it'll control two radios off of one, two, two, three box. We can do just normal traffic. We can hear. It's got muted, unmuted audio. Just like a nice little regular dispatch box. And then you can go up to the 10 channel or the 16 channel. And of course, the, the features get it. You get into the 16. You've got all of your basic, you know, dispatch. If you're setting up a, a dispatch at the facility, uh, we had we had it. Let's see a picture here. Can we go there? Um, On-site paging. We used to do a lot with it, we have it. But if you've got a whole bunch of digital pagers floating around that you're not using anymore, you know, don't throw them away. It's really easy, even if it's like a goal A. You, know, you can get encoders for those pretty inexpensively. Set up a, a channel for that and use them. If, if you've got, what's the biggest problem getting a hold of X Chief or that bear? You can, oh yeah, you know, listen to your radio. What do they do with the radio? They go in for press conferences, meetings, what do they do in the radio? Click. All right. Either have paging capability in the newer radios, it's becoming very easy to do. Either have selective call on the radio, so you can page them that way. Or take one of those old Goldway pagers and have a little, you know, low power 510 watt transmitter in the, in the command vehicle and hand them out to those people that don't really need a radio, but when you need them, you need to get a hold of them, you need to get a hold of them. Give them that pager on site. A little on site paging is inexpensive. You can buy, uh, we bought pagers for three bucks. Just a, a numeric pager about five years ago, and I got about 40 or 50 of those things for three bucks a piece. And it gave me pro two programming kits for 10 bucks. You know, if we lose them, I don't, I don't get mad if they lose it. So, and they work great. Right. You just do a little pull away transmitter and you can just punch out a code. Um, actually, the uh, telex, uh, the, the telex terminal has quite a bit of, of uh, paging capability built into the oh, that one does. Actually, that one does too. Limited. But a lot of your radios, you can do that. Take advantage, especially in your field deployable, because there's nothing worse when you need that that police chief or fire chief. You can't get them. Right? How many departments have gotten rid of their paging and just gone to they carry a radio? Any of them? You got rid of your pagers? Are we still hanging on to them? It's still the most reliable way to get a hold of somebody. You know, plain and simple. We're using we use some of the radios um, for paging for our team uh, with the county, just two tone paging. But you know what? What happens is they have a tendency, and ICOM just released uh, their F50s and F60s. You've seen those. It has a real nice paging vibe mode. You know, a pager and a radio. And I told them, I said, you know what, plain and simple, you can't have a radio scanning and use it for a reliable pager. It just doesn't not work. Plain and simple, doesn't work. Put a dual watch receiver in there so that the, the, there's a separate little receiver for the paging function. That would be great. I 
love to see that. But the manufacturers have, and I talked to the vice president, Chris Motor, uh, Nikon, you know, and said, this is what we need to do. But, I don't know. They spent a lot of time and money. It would be interesting to see how popular it becomes. It will probably be in the middle. That's the water tower at Spence International Airport. I think that's used loosely. <laughs> uh, it's big enough to take international flights, I guess. That's how that gets classified. We have somebody from uh, LAX. How's that, how's that based? What are they, how do they classify it in an international airport? Uh, it's not a very big airport, but I think they classify it as an international airport. Uh, I, I think that's based on runway length, I guess. Um, that's two of our guys up there. They're setting up a uh, UHF, that UTAC-3 repeater. That thing's running 20 watts. It's two Motorola radiuses with a rip controller on right. The repeater is hanging in its box. Uh, you access those things. Those two go straight up through the center. Okay, the, the base is hollow. When you get to the water tank, there's a tube through the water to the top. There's a hatch on the top. That's how you get out most of the, the ball tops like that. Um, and then there's a very small rail it's basically just a, it's really just a, to stop you from sliding and you can hook into uh, your safety. And it gives you, there's about that much of height, little stubs of metal coming up. So you have to learn, and if you're going to be deploying systems under disaster conditions, how do we put up an antenna on something like that? Right? What's Stennis going to let us do? Uh, welding was not an option. Logistically getting welder and getting it up there during those conditions would be a little hard. But they're not really keen on, on starting to weld mounts to the top of the thing. So I'll tell you right now. Here you go. Who's our best friends? Duct tape, wire tape, right? And then after that, the next best thing is hose clamps. You know, stainless steel screw down radiator hose clamps. And then they're really great to make those things up into sizes like this down, or you can daisy chain a bunch together. You can build anything with hose clamps, duct tape, and wire tape. Don't care what it is, you can put it up. You can put up microwave, you can put up radio and tennis. Uh, there's a will, there's a way. With those three things, you can do most of it. So taking, uh, getting up there, what we did is we used hose clamps and wire ties. And we put the, and all we had was a little max rat, I think that one. Two or three dB gain. That's about uh, about that big little fiberglass stick in my max rig. Been using it for years. Works great. It's only a couple dB gain. We covered the whole lower end of that county with 20 watts portable, portable, and mobile in the New Orleans. From there, they had two 800 trunk systems running, and I had one of the portables for a while. And there was many places I just could not talk on that 800 trunk, with, even with those two sites linked together. Just, you just couldn't do it. First off, they didn't have the height. And I'll show you. Yeah, the back. Ah, uh, the future. Oh, luggage mount. High down. Luggage mount. Clamps. Brands in it might also work. Luggage. You can buy. It. I can't remember the manufacturer, but I've seen them. So, mobile antenna mount for a luggage rack. Oh, for luggage racks, yeah. Yeah. Mark, no. See, yeah you you an NMO is like a clamp right. uh, to clamp onto like rails and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, those are the types of things you need to think about, if, especially if you're going to be doing, I mean, even in your own area. I mean, if, you know, and we've got a wide variety, if you get hit with hurricanes or tornadoes, and we've had a lot of tornadoes. <laughs> Anybody here been involved in the tornadoes? Hit with that? No, they're probably still busy trying to get things um, You know, I mean, we all have a wide variety of things, whether it's snow, ice, tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, that's going to take down our own systems. How do we get those back up? Well, 
the main systems, we're going to get them back up with our contractors, hopefully. All right? <coughs> but our tactical stuff that we're going to be using to get you know, law enforcement up, those are the things we're going to be using our repeaters that the SWAT guys have. We're going to be using hopefully portable repeaters that fire companies have, those types of things. And those, that, may all, that may be all you have for a couple days. So where can you get it? Places like that. Have extra antennas, have extra cable on some of those sites so that you can bring stuff in. I'll tell you, water towers were a lifesaver for training for us. We, we had so much stuff. A lot of our hops were on water towers. I never saw a water tower that failed. Never saw a water tower down there and fail. Okay? I saw towers that failed. Most of the commercial towers even survived. I mean, the engineering guys on most of the commercial cell towers did eight one jobs. There was some that went down. What happened was the generation and electronics at the base was flooded by 30 feet of water. The towers, but all the water towers. Right? We used seven or eight different water towers throughout the area to put mostly micro air, uh, the same micro air, the five gig, and two point four gig, nine hundred uh, links in for the data. But this one we had the UHF base antenna on it. There's a bunch of different antennas. Think about what you're going to use for antennas. Um, keep it simple. You know, Craco. Uh, which is Kreckman's, actually right in my backyard, I've known for years, uh, it's Kreckman antennas. They make a lot of stuff for the airports. Makes some really nice, inexpensive aluminum antennas. Uh, Max Red makes some nice small ones. And the am ham dies, I know the Ringos. Ringos uh, aren't bad, but they're tunable. We've used a bunch of those. And, um, the, uh, you know, have some way of caching those and in case they are protected. You know, there's nothing worse when you go to pull the antenna out it's all mangled and bent and, you know, don't leave your cables connected, pull them out because they'll break off, those types of things. Have some way of protecting it, transporting it, keeping it cached and in the group. You know, mobile antennas, one of the things that we always keep in the cache is we keep a bunch of, we have a bunch of uh, radius, Pick them up cheap off eBay. Um, either two channel, 16 channel, um, VHF mostly now. Um, that will use, we're switching from our UHF, we're going more to VHF. Hopefully, we're going to go 6.25 system in the future if we get the funding. But uh, have some mobiles, and we'll keep a bunch of mobiles with mag mount antennas and center Because what are you going to do in a disaster, especially if you're responding in to help somebody else? You know, you're going to go in with a certain amount. If you're flying in, like we'll do, you're not taking your vehicles with you. So you're going to have to beg, borrow, beg, borrow, rent um, vehicles. So how do you put radios in? Well, we're not going to do a fancy install. Velcro, next best thing to duct tape and wire. Right? It's a little bit of a sticky Velcro. Mag down on the top and circuit lever plug. Right? You've got a mobile. Because if we're not running repeaters, 25, 30 watts makes a big difference in that portal. Okay? So think about those things. Keep a couple extra radios there. Again, interoperability issue. If you're dealing with other agencies, you can now, got a couple of these, you can say, here, here's one of our radios. And the mobiles are less likely to disappear than the portables, right? <coughs> the portables have a tendency to walk easier or to keep track of them. The mobile's a little bit bigger bulk here, and it's more noticeable when it disappears off the counter. So, mobile antennas, have some mobile antennas. Even if you're using portables, we did this National Guard, we had a problem because we were covering a fairly large area with the system we had there. You know, these, this one here, on the uh, ICOM, they have a special BNC adapter for this one. Uh, most, all the manufacturers have some sort on the, this is the 50, that's got an SMA. Makes a big, big difference. There again, what are we doing? Height. We're getting out of the metal box. Okay. We're getting a little bit higher. All right. And that makes a big difference. And when you're talking a half mile with this, because what do you do when you talk? What do you do? How many people do that? Do people do this when they talk? Do they get it up high above their head? No. They're going to do this in one? Okay. So what do they do? First off, they're changing their plane and the signal. Instead of keeping it vertical, it's not hard to 
and they're bringing it back behind their head. That's why I have memory loss. Actually, uh, partial loss. Partial loss. What's that? The cheaper antenna, though, the little bit of antenna is probably going to look better if they do like that. The higher beam antenna is more directional, so you can turn it off. You know, when they're not in the right plane, it's not going to look as good as the cheap one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the rubber duckies are very, really, are not as very effective. That's one of the things that Finity brags about their antenna design is that their antenna design talks farther than most of the radios because of the design of the antenna. So antennas are important and cable is cabling is real important. You can have the best antenna, the best radio, you throw a crappy piece of cable in between there with crappy connectors or wet connectors and nothing is gonna save it. Just plain and simple. Keep your connectors dry, keep you know, don't let them get dirty, don't let them get banged up. Protect the cables and have a variety of cable. Okay, 20 footers, 50 footers, 100 footers, 200 footers, depending on what you're doing. And look at you know this. You need to get the tech guys, you know, the tech people. You know they'll know what kind of cables to use. Uh, you don't want to be using hard lights, 214s or pop. We use a lot of that. Have a variety and a whole bunch of adapters because. A lot of times you're going to go in. I mean, we many of times we've gone into repeater sites, and uh, the hams are great. You know, let's we'll say you know, we've had an operation. We'll go in and take over an an ham antenna, put our repeater on a ham antenna, and we're out of band a little bit. But in UHF, it's kind of forgiving. Generally, will work. Um, and it, but we're we're trading off performance for height, and as long as it works, you know, that's that's the main thing. It's not going to be tuned perfectly to work, but we're gaining that height and location. Portable repeaters. Uh, that's one of our rigs we took down. This was getting ready to go down on our second trip to the Gulf. Uh, it's, it's a military shelter, surplus military shelter on a trailer, 50 foot mast on it. Put together on a low budget. Right. And over here we have two, that's two of the ICOM repeater packages. And all that is, is uh, it's two mobiles, and they have their own a little controller inside that they're using. And it's just two mobile radios with a repeater control. And the duplexer in this setup here, the duplexer is inside of it. And then it's in a shipping case. That shipping case, the front and the back comes off. So you get out the front of the controls, the back comes off, and get out your electrical and antenna. And those are, I'm uh, thinking, $1,400 or $1,500, maybe somewhere in there. Uh, maybe a little bit under that. And it, uh, you, know, you can do that VHF, UHF, 800. You can do cross bands and that type of a package. Do an 800 to a UHF. So, that, like, if you're running eight and you got your fire companies on UHF or BHF or something, you could build that with the two radios and a controller, very inexpensively, and that gives you the pre-plan in your head, gives you that interoperability with that agency that you otherwise can't talk with. Now, do we want to take that and put? His primary, what's your primary channel? You know, Me? Yeah. Well, talk group, so every talk, agency. All talk group based, right? Yes. Okay. So you have a law enforcement channel? Yes. Okay. We're going to take his law enforcement channel. So should we take his law enforcement channel and connect it to the county fire channel or the county police channel? Sure. We should? Yeah, necessary. Because too much traffic. Don't don't like yeah, we don't do that. <laughs> Under the worst of conditions in a very rare instance would you want to connect the primary dispatch operational channel to the primary operation channel. <coughs> It'll lead to chaos. Because what's going to happen? You've got all that law enforcement channel from his facility, NASA, now on the county or regional group for that law enforcement. And nobody, and even if you make announcements, it's just going to lead to chaos. There was a JPS system down in New Orleans. And there wasn't, I mean, even Wednesday when we 
we got there, I mean, it still wasn't anything really working. The sheriff's department was using, the fire company were using mostly direct, I think there was a, a moto, uh, motor, motor bridge, but a motor roll system that went into, what do they call it, fail safe, fail, fail soft, fail soft. Uh, mode, so basically it's like a one channel. Uh, and somebody brought in a GPS, an organization brought in a GPS, and they thought it would be really helpful to take all the interoperability channels and connect them to the sheriff's supply chain. So now you had all the sheriff's traffic on that one simplex channel coming out on all of the VHF, and, or not all, a good number of the VHF and UHF interoperability channels. And then they threw the fire company on top by the stick. And then, what did they do? Walked away from it. So there was about two and a half, three hours of real confusion. So there's there's been a big push, I'm not sure if the FCC's come up with a mandate yet, I don't know if anybody else has heard that, on doing voice ID and LND interoperability switches, which I really think is, it should be required. So what you're going to do is if you put your interoperability switch on and you connect anything together, as soon as you connect it, it's going to do a voice ID. It's not going to do a FCC call, but it'll come up. This is uh, Jefferson County PD Command 721 interoperability. Some sort of ID. So when you start hearing a bunch of traffic on your system and you don't know who or why, you'll have an identification coming up. Now, at least you know who it is whether you can still find it, but you, at least now you know who to look for. And it was a couple hours worth of confusion based on the, uh, So anyway, the capability in this, we can bring this in. Um, and then you notice we don't have racks and radios mounted in racks in there, because why? I don't know if that radio is going to be in that trailer, or I'm going to go on the top of the Century Plaza Hotel. Put my radios because that's where I prefer to be. I'd rather be, you know, on top of the big hotel. All right. Went to a room with Natalie Hall on a search. Okay. We were there eight days. Day six and a half, my repeater showed up because uh, TSA didn't like it. But held it at the cost, got it sent. So we had a whole bunch of radios. We were trying to talk around Aruba. We had to get permission from the Aruba government. We, we got that to bring it in and run the frequency the previous day before we got there. But the repeater never made it. We were running simplex. But uh, when we finally got it there, we went to the Hilton. I think it was the Hilton, which was a little bit north of the center of uh, the island. We covered probably 65% there in that UTAC, UTAC 3 repeater. Okay? But it doesn't take a lot of money, a lot of technology to give you some basic capability. You know, now if you're dealing with controlling 300, 400, 500, 600 units in a disaster, you're probably not moving that to another area, so hopefully your, your base system is going to be operational. But even with a USAR team, you can have 50 or 60 people. You can still do that with one or two channels if you have good training and good you know, good control over your people. They understand how to how to use it. <coughs> Talking about RF help. <laughs> There's uh, eight actually it's up there with yeah, eight eight UHF repeaters, four Singar, Singar is the military, the big green radio that they've had a bunch of different versions. The newer ones have gotten more digital and fancy than that. They're kind of hard to see them. They're sitting up in the rack up in here. Um, you see the repeaters that we had before in the previous shot sitting up here? What did I say? We had duplexers inside of that box, right? Against better judgment, they opted to go with a mobile duplexer against recommendations to go with a much better, higher quality duplexer. See this down here? Those were the most expensive duplexes I've ever seen purchased. Because <laughs> they were, ICOM got those, tuned those, and shipped them in about two days. I'll give them credit for that. Um, because the, the, the repeaters were trashing each other. You had eight repeaters inside that little box, that exercise. 
And part of it was, was it was not supposed to be that much together at one site, but some of the other sites fell through. So we ended up with eight repeaters at one site instead of four. And those four were coordinated frequency-wise and uh, RF-wise as far as interference to work with each other. Uh, and they had said that the mobile duplexes would work, and I said, no. Nah. But they did. It didn't work. Plus, we added the other four repeaters there that we couldn't get the other site. So we ended up having to go to duplex. Now, unless you're going to, in a mobile application or field application, if you're generally going to be up on top of the you know, hotel with a single repeater, that little duplexer that costs you 300 bucks is usually going to work. And they work quite well. We, we use one in ours all the time. That's what we used it against. But we had nothing else right near us. The only, thing else, the only other thing on that tower we had was 900 and uh, some 5.8 and uh, 2.4. So it was far enough away to bother. So think about how you're going to deploy some of this stuff. If you're going to have a communications portable repeater unit, where you're going to be running it out of a trailer, you know, talk to your RF guys, talk to your, you know, really spend the money on the duplexers. Don't go cheap on duplexers. And then and you may want to do some, you may need to do some <coughs> filtration in that depending on your frequency. <clears throat> we had one, we had to put another filter on one unit. It was causing problems in there. That resolved it. But this, this tower here is a sniper tower. It's used by uh, the SEALs. And they go up there with their scopes and there's there's like uh, simulated rooftops and stuff that you can't really see. There's a rooftop that sits down back in here. And they can go up there and lay on there and they have a big cut down through the woods down the side of the mountain. And they can do some you know, fairly long shots. Uh, so we got permission finally to get on this. Um, this is Camp Adver. And we added, we needed more height, we added uh, three six and a half foot sections of tower scaffolding, military tower scaffolding. On top of that, we erected it and basically we put it up and guided it down. Made a very stable platform. We did a uh, Motorola. Uh, that was a five gig hop off of here on a canopy system. And we did, you can't see the other one, there was one, this one was hopping back to the command post about uh, six miles. And then the other side was hopping all the way to the down, down range area of about, uh, about another seven miles, I think. So we had 14, it was about 14 miles from the lower end. So what that did is it gave us an IP connection, of course, at the far end, and it gave us an IP connection at this tower. And that was all connected into the, the network that we had set up specifically for the training exercise. And although this isn't a disaster, it's a, it's, I'm using this as a good example of how you can deploy some of this. The, uh, so what we were doing is we built these, this is all Ringo's, and there again, that's not was not my recommendation for Antennas and that turned out to haunt me and uh, performance-wise, the Ringo antenna is not the best. You would have had a much better performing system if you not a better, a little bit better quality antenna. And then we had the Singard military uh, antennas. That's this being that's being pulled up the side of the tower. We had four of those, one on each corner that was run. Uh, so there's a lot of RF set of tempering, you know, there again. A lot of this you can punch in. There's programs available that you can get that you can enter your frequencies, and it'll tell you what you're going to have issues with as far as first, second, third, fourth IFs, and those types of issues. And it pays to look at that because if, if you have the option to change channels, now all of this is all military, so that's all <coughs> through the through their coordinator, and that'll all be done ahead of time. And it was not. We ended up changing I think two of the frequencies we had to request it, and they got that through pretty quick in about a day and a half. And we did have a lot of desensing problems, and we had to retune, change, and, and simply by changing this repeater from this antenna and this antenna with that repeater, switching those two, I mean, it's, it's enough to change the paths and how they're interacting with each other. Okay, so you know everybody, well, they're all inside the same box. Well, everything in there was fairly well shielded, you know, cable-wise, it was good cable. But, um, 
the antennas were just the way they were getting their path and radiating up there would make a difference. So a lot of times, just you know, changing the antennas around makes a difference. Um, that's the rack. This was at the command post. And the problem they've had in past years, we had, you know, it was desensing at the command post. And they've got uh, about 14 or 15 base stations, and they had mobiles set up, and they would run wires out, stick an antenna outside the building. So everybody that had to talk had their own mobile radio, basically, or a portable with an external antenna on some of them. So what did we do? We put 14 or 15 20 watt transmitters inside of a room at the command post. What happens? Decent. We're back to decent. So he'd key up to talk on one channel. He'd be listening to somebody out in the field on this channel. He keys up and he goes away. And it was a real issue at the exercise. And this is a big exercise. It's 500, you know, soldiers, and you name it, all kinds of equipment when they're out, you know, doing their their training and their working. So what I came up with is we went to Telex system. The RF package, all the radios were together. And here again, we had to look at what frequencies we're using. We're putting them all in the same rack, but we're running five watts. Because all we need to do is to talk to the repeater. And we had outside antennas, okay? And we had one uh, descent issue which we resolved with a filter. We were able to run, and I think we had uh, uh, well, we had 12, 12 channels out of there. And what it is is you got the there's four molds here, right? There's 12 radios, and then an extra that was an extra back. Um, the four radios, icon mobiles are sitting there. There's, two, there's a two two three and a two two three. Each two two three does two radios. And basically, then a power supply, and that was an auto switch to a battery. And batteries underneath, so we had instantaneous backup. We go down if we lost primary power, because that was a big concern. The building lost power, the whole thing goes away. So we had backup power. So now that brings it up into the network. This was a the only the only 16 channel no, we had two 16 channel consoles. The uh, commander of the exercise had one in his office, and we had one in the comm room. And we could monitor uh, all 12 of those, right? Plus the four SIN guard channels from that. And we could interconnect any of those. And then we also set up a couple of other uh, crossband links using some other 223s, so that certain administrators could monitor uh, with their portable they could monitor some other traffic by we were just cross banding it over and sticking it and all we did is look at 223 with portable and it was just in building because what happened is people had portables or outside they could hit the repeater what happens they walked in the building we're six seven miles away they walked in the building they would have trouble inside the building hearing the repeater the, the, the primary administrator repeater so what did we do? We added a channel, Simplex, on a portable. We put it, hooked it to a 223. We stuffed it in. We pulled one of the signal channels off of, this, off of that network. We didn't need it. And we dumped the administrative repeater channel traffic through that 223 to a different Simplex channel in the building. So when they were in the building, all they had to do was switch to the channel. They switched to a different channel and went to Simplex and talk simplex to the portable sitting in the comm room. And that was passing all the traffic off that repeater to that simplex channel. And it worked simple, sweet, very effective. They loved it. They just had to remember to switch the channel. That was, you know, you had to switch it over to the simplex channel in the room. But it was a, wasn't planned, it was a fix that we did on the fly during the exercise. And that's a four channel, uh, video, video, four channels video, two channels audio, and I was re I had a camera set up where we were recording um, traffic, the indicator because it gives you your traffic and trying to you know monitor some of the audio and stuff. Looking for that, we did set that up when we were having the issues because we had too much traffic. All right, portable towers and mass. I'll breeze through some of this. 
How many people have a portable tower at your disposal? One in the back, two in the back. Um, it's, you know, it really makes all the difference in the world. Uh, this is one of those, these were built for the Army. Uh, got a 100 foot telescopic mass, looks over the back. This is a 60 foot, that's an Aluma tower on an ICS uh, box and trailer package. Um, there again, this is being used by the Army for uh, training for the same thing as the battery was. Uh, way big generator, too big a generator for the drill. And then uh, this one has a little 7K. Um, this is a modular building. These are modular. Basically, they're like refrigerators. You ever see the modular refrigerators they put together? It's the same type of thing. Uh, it's just beefed up. It's, it's a little bit heavier. And, uh, but they're real nice because they're four inches of insulated wall. So it doesn't take a lot to cool. You just have to have enough cooling to handle your, your heat load from your equipment. And uh, this will get you 100 foot. That's a pneumatic. It'll get you up 100 foot. That'll do a 60 foot. You can do those 60, 80, or 100. Pricing depends where you go. You, know, you can spend twenty thousand dollars for an eighty foot with no box to you know, hundred thousand dollars, depending on what you want to put on it or more. But it, there again, what are we talking about? Height. Everything is height, right? The higher you can get your antenna, the better you can talk. When we were in Wednesday in New Orleans, we had that UTAC repeater. Our tower, we took a 80 foot tower and a trailer, and in Tennessee, we had a problem with the truck that was towing it, was overheating the transmission. We had to leave that tower with the Tennessee Fire Department, and they were great. They actually gave it back to us on the way back. Um, we, we didn't get it down, so we now got down to New Orleans, had a great UTAC repeater there, and what did we have to put it on? Not much. We had to improvise. It was hard, we couldn't find, we were so tied up, we had limited manpower. Uh, we put it up on a 20, like little 22 foot telescopic mass on the truck. We put it up on top of that, and uh, I'll say it performed poorly. It's the first time I've ever had it because we did not have the height. We got a couple of blocks down in the boats away from the command where we were set up, and we lost the repeater. We lost the repeater. It, it was terrible, terrible, terrible communication. Worst, you know, worst I've ever seen. That's one of the uh, Motorola 800 trunk systems that was up down there. Uh, FEMA basically contracted the Motorola and uh, one of their dealers, I guess, a couple of years ago, to bring in a Motorola trunk system. And they, I heard uh, officially a million dollar range of worth of equipment, mobiles, portables, and basically brought that in and said to the county, you know, here it is, put it in. We'll give you a radio, so they put everybody on it, you know, sign all the groups, and you, know, you had fire and search and rescue and use our teams, and uh, every, anybody and everything basically with mobiles and portals. And they were just there, they were just slapping radios in, circuit lighters, mag antennas, that type, that type of setup in the fire trucks. Plus, you had fire trucks coming in, and you remember most of the fire trucks there were there or using them. So, you had under FEMA, through EMAC agreements, you had all kinds of equipment and manpower coming in to provide service locally at this point. This is, you know, three or four weeks down the road. Uh, so they were providing this 800 trunk system, you know, to the county to get some resemblance of operation back up. And uh, it, that tower, um, well, one of the things I noticed, and anybody notice what, see how much space is between there and there? I don't think it's all the way up, first off. I think it's probably only in the 60, 60 foot range, I'm guessing. And I don't think it was all the way up. And it was right in town at Walmart Park. Um, I, I, you know, I, I didn't look at doing a frequency study on it, but I, I think just knowing the county and spending a lot of time down there, there's probably a couple of places that could have been a little bit better. Uh, it didn't cover it well. It didn't cover it well. And I heard comments back that the county didn't even want to, they were going to give them the system, basically. And the county didn't want it. Why? Anybody on that route yet? <laughs> I'm sure he was 
couple, I think. You know, two sites is not going to do it, right? How much more money are they going to have to put into that system to bring it up to coverage standards to meet public safety's needs? Probably have to add two or three more sites at least. So they have to have the money to do that. I don't know if they ever took it or not. I don't know anybody here of them. If they kept it and still use it or not. You know, the problem with 800 is you, everybody says, well, we use 800 and, and higher on our cell phones. But look at the infrastructure that the companies have to put in to maintain that. You know, we do it with a little teeny portable phone, right? How much money? You're talking millions and millions and millions of dollars. Massive numbers of sites, microcells, pico cells, all that to give us that coverage so the kids can talk about you know, the math test. So, 800, some areas, I mean, 800 is great, you know, I'm sure it works well. Uh, I'm just, you know, how many, how many people run low band? 30, 50, right? Still using it, right? Do you want to get off of it? No. It's great. You don't have to narrow band either. So, uh, you know, it works real well, and there's a lot of things you can do in that. They, they should be thumped with more technology, and I think it too. Know, what we're going to do with the VHF and UHF, which they are. I mean, that's where the 6.25 take these things and trunk them. You know, you know, they'll eventually have that capability of trunking. Uh, there's this big push for 700. I, you know, it's plain and simple. I, I don't see how we're ever going to be able to come up with a band that can do it. It's not, I'm not going to do just one band. There is no simple answer. Pre planning is really the answer. Um, use what you can access. And again, like I said, the water towers. There's a commercial tower up over here that's uh, that survived. I mean, you remember now there was 30 feet of water went through. Well, maybe a little bit less here, but there's you know, everything in that area right there was underwater. In the way that there. Fortunately, I don't have my photos. I lost them in the fire. Back in the 90s, when we went down for Hurricane Andrew, in Florida, I had some great pictures of uh, Metro Dade fire departments. Anybody here from down that area? Still trying to find some copies of those photos. They had uh, four laboratories set up in the field down towards uh, Homestead, and we're running repeaters off those the laboratories. We just had the laboratories up to uh, I understand one or two of them actually were had to be replaced. The ladders had to be replaced because they were up during the storm and it tweaked them. But you know, use what you can to get it up. You know, height is your friend. It's all important. The higher you can get, it's not a matter of power. It's a matter of how the height and just a good transmission system. Interoperability. J.D. Smith, whoever you are. This was on one of the lists so I'm grabbing. I'll give him credit for it. I thought it was a good little opener to interoperability. My humble opinion, interoperability is not a technical problem. It, it is a management problem. It does not matter who you are or where you are. If you cannot communicate with your neighbor, you have failed to do so. You have failed to plan to do so. Right? How many interoperability issues can be alleviated by pre-planning? Right? It doesn't take $2 million worth of communications to do this. All right? It takes pre plan It takes knowing who your neighbors are. If you're running a VHF system and your neighbor's on VHF and you don't have their frequency programmed in some of your radios, it doesn't have to be all, are you failing to do your job? At this point in time in, in, in all our lives, yes, you are. Because you should know better. It's it's really it's a matter of knowing what frequencies are around you. Generally, interoperability, you're going to deal with people that are normally going to be coming into your jurisdiction, or you are going to be going to their jurisdiction because of a pre-planned arrangement. Now, unless you're like a USAR team, FEMA, something like us, I mean, we could end up going. I mean, we go basically anywhere in the country at the request of a government agency. No charge. We don't have to have EMAC. 
We'd like to have EMAC, but we don't have to have any EMAC requests to do it. All right. So for those types of teams, yes, you need to have some flexibility in doing things differently. But to be able to talk to, if you're going to have a major incident like the bridge collapse, right? Can you talk to the Coast Guard? Right? You have the capability of talking to the Coast Guard if they're in your area. Does the Coast Guard have the capability of talking to you? A lot of that can probably be done through pre planning. You guys do anything with the, are you both comp guys? Do you do anything with the Channel 25 on interoperability plan? Are you using that at all? It's the old Marine telephone, one of the Marine telephone channels? We have it. No? It's a great, I mean, we use it. We, we, we used it really heavy uh, under the interoperability. One of the channels is the old Channel 25, Marine Channel 25. And it was one of the, remember this is a good ship lollipop, marine operator, want to make a phone call? Remember those days, anyway? Okay. Before cell phones, that's how you made a phone call or got a phone call on a boat. We call a marine operator on one of the marine operator channels. Well, they're virtually non-existent. They, they're still used in very few places. Um, basically very remote where they don't have cell phones. But most everybody uses cell phones now, right? So they're not using this. Well, in the Wisdom, when they were setting up the interoperability channels, they set that up as one of the channels for interoperability. And um, it's kind of unclear if it's supposed to be strictly for marine operability. I think that was the intention. Uh, we use it for our, for our water rescue team, for our disaster team. We have a 20-watt repeater on that. And we can run that repeater. We can run it carrier squelch, or we can run it tone guard on the input. Either way. We had that set up in side L on our second trip down, and all the, all the uh, law enforcement and boats, you know, we let them use it. We just said, hey, channel 25, they can talk all the way from uh, basically New Orleans up through side L and mm, 15 miles, 20 miles down the coast towards water with a marine radio and boat. Okay. Real simple. $1,200 worth of equipment. And it, they just, they couldn't believe it. You know, they could not believe it. You normally not running repeaters on marine channels. But that capability is, is, is there, and I think it's highly unutilized. Um, but it's nice because you can use a regular, you can use a regular $20 marine radio. If you have the tone open, you can have a regular marine radio. So we, we were getting donations of marine radios when we were in New Orleans and just handing them out because we had dozens and dozens of volunteer boat handlers there, you know, boat operators. And uh, most of them didn't have radios. So we were scrounging up marine radios and just running 25 open. We were giving most of the radios we never got back. It worked. That was later, later, just before we left. Any questions? So, you know, there again, plan, plan, plan. If you do, if you do your legwork ahead of time, a lot of these toys are just toys. Real, real. I mean, it's great technology, but you know what? I put a, an email out on a couple of the lists. So maybe you may have seen me put the email out. I was looking for stories of interoperability success. Okay. Now I'm not talking about you got the state cop and the local cop, you know, and you can connect them together in a pursuit. That's that's interoperability, it's a different interoperability. But disaster, major incident, okay? Connecting two or three different agencies together. All right. There's a the report on the uh, Pentagon is pretty interesting with some success there, I think. Anybody else have any? Any real big success? Yeah. Major flood we tied to UHF and VHF police and fire together and split teams up with different agencies as right. mixed teams to do water rescues and they were fantastic. We used one of the uh, um, 1,000, JPS 1,000. Okay, JPS 1,000. That was really great. And that was, you were saying it was flooding? Yeah, we had a 
Where, where are you from? Where? Tucson, Arizona. Tucson. Yeah. Is that recent? That was. Uh, yeah, about a year and a half. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, so I'd be happy to I'd be elated if anybody's got any stories like that. Please, my cards are up here and it's on the website. And, and I, you know, if you have any narratives or after action reports or those types of things, I really love to hear about. It. You don't hear a lot of them where it really all came together and worked and was better. Uh, I've heard lots of stories where it didn't work or, well, we couldn't get it to work. I mean, I saw a National Guard unit down uh, the Gulf Coast had a brand new JPS 1000 system never opened. They didn't open it. I'm serious. They had not, it went in the store, it had never been opened. Didn't know how to get it to fire up. It took me two hours. And, I, and I've done some stuff with JPS before that. And I've since that gone down and gone through their whole class and on it. And I still probably have it because I don't use it on a day to day. We don't have a JPS unit. So we don't use it day to day. Yeah. One of the things I've heard of with the JPS is that uh, it's very complicated, of course. But uh, communications officers from police, fire, EMS will be trained extensively on it, and then a year later move on to another position. Yes. And from the representatives, we've heard that uh, most of the JPS equipment is in a warehouse. Yeah. Yeah, it is. There's a lot of it sitting in caches, and uh, if something happens. It's oh yeah, we have it. And that's part of what the, you know, I've gotten on this crusade the past couple of years is to try and, you know, I mean, this equipment's great. And there's a, there is a need for it, especially in bigger, you know, more mobile disasters uh, to be able to deploy this stuff. But it takes training and it takes practice. And the, the best thing about practice, you know, there's a lot of, the grant money is out there. And it isn't, what is it, 80-20 split, I think, on it, or yes. for most of the grant. It's 100% of training. You know, so you can you can put in for training on that grant money to us and pay the whole bill on that grant money, and, it, and it's separate money from your equipment. So you know, keep that in mind, and, and then you know, like I said, we're we're looking to bring, we're going to try and come up with a train train and bring some other people in. If I can't, you know, I, we're not going to spread the word, so to speak, with uh, one person uh, doing it. We have we have about four or five people right now. Looking at doing it in a couple of areas around the country, so we're trying to spread that out. But whether it's this training or whatever, your own in-house training, uh, we have a website. A lot of this stuff will be available for like awareness and ops levels. We can do that on the website. You can you go in and it's a moderate fee, twenty-five, thirty-five dollars, and most of it's going to be, and uh, take those classes online and get a print your own certificate right off off the uh, computer on the front. So it's real simple. Uh, they're they're working on the uh, all hazard uh, calm uh, program. I, I think there's been some movement there. Uh, there's some trainings in the USAR. We're not we're not looking at there again. The USAR training is very specific to the USAR team. It's designed to support the USAR team. It's not designed. Most of what we're doing is designed for the calm guy to support anybody and everybody. And that's part of why we push the philosophy of bringing in the corporate sponsors to bring in different pieces of equipment. Because if you have a disaster, are you going to see it, even if you don't own a JPS 1000, are you going to see a JPS 1000 in disaster? Guaranteed. You know? If you're dealing with the military, you're going to see one of the CAT systems probably. They do a lot of military. You know? And there's a bunch of stuff with Telex. Telex is a, I mean, Telex Vega, you know, they're, they're, they're Mentality is, and I think still is, and I, I haven't ever gotten anywhere and pushing it for a field disaster. There is dispatch, and they, they have some great stuff where you can do interstate communications, interoperability, and it's really neat. But it doesn't really address, you know, getting resources into a site of an airplane crash in the middle of nowhere. Those types of things, and that's. You know. We've got to tell us that we've got those in all of our mobile comm suites now. Yeah. A bunch of CDMs and program everybody's frequencies into them. And yep. those things actually work on a wireless laptop pretty well. Yep. Somebody says they like their radio to talk to Exxon's radio. We just. Uh, your JPS, you're talking about? Pick the channel, that's it. On a JPS? Or a Telex? Telex. Telex, yeah. Yeah, they both, they both do it. I, you know, I, said, I like the Telex. It's, uh, it, it 
they come up with a more reasonably priced software program that you could afford to buy a dozen licenses. Also, you know what? I don't want to show you somebody might hijack it on it. It's worth two thousand. You got to have a dongle key to run the software. Really biggest pretty cool dongle key. Yeah, it's the biggest pain in the neck. But that dongle key is, you know, it's worth depending on what version of the software. It's a couple thousand dollars. You lose it, you're done. Goodbye. You break it, you know. Or if you get a lousy connection, like we've had, that's what happened to me last year. My dongle. It was a dongle issue. I think is what caused my problem with my demo last year. Um, need to get rid of that for field. Come up with a. You buy a license, you're good for 20, you know, buy a single license, you're good for 25 computers or whatever, and however they want to do it, but get rid of the dongle, dongle key. And make it reasonable. That's that's one of the big drawbacks I've seen on uh, ACU, free software. You buy a, you know, it's an expensive piece of equipment, but you can buy that basic uh, software to run it on your laptop, you can get that for free. So everybody's got advantages and disadvantages. And, you know, realistically, none of them are really any better or any worse. They, they all have their own strengths and weaknesses. Okay. Depends what you want to do. Ultimately, keep it something stupid. Because, you know, the uh,